Hello, I'm Michael Dowd. This is my main evening program or my main follow-up program. What I typically do is deliver a 15 to 20 minute homily for uh, Christian Unitarian Universalist Jewish congregations. And then this link is sent to the membership. And then about a week later, I do a Q&A, hour long or longer Q&A based on this. I can also deliver this live, but it's kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of content. So I encourage congregations, uh, secular groups, to give this link out, and then that way people can stop it along the way. So I'm going to share my screen. This is where I am now in Eureka, California, surrounded by amazing redwood trees. So the title of this program is Finding Meaning in the Dark, Sobering Inspiration for Hard Times. It's a two-part series. They can be watched in either order. Post-Doom Thinking and Living is the overall title. I'll be covering this program, Finding Meaning in the Dark. What we'll be looking at is where are we, what lies ahead, and then how shall we live? How then shall we live? The second program, Embracing Our Predicament, Trading Confusion for Clarity. We look at how did we get here, why was it unavoidable, and, and what now? So this program, Finding Meaning in the Dark, here's where we'll go. The big picture, understanding our predicament and our trajectory. What's inevitable, what's futile, accepting reality and avoiding frustration. Post-doom inspiration, what am I meaning by post-doom? Remember who you are and what matters most. And then what can we do? Engaging in prophetic and redemptive great work. When I deliver this in uh, live presentations, uh, back when we were meeting in a pre-coronavirus era, this kind of material, there's a lot of stuff here. So I encourage you, since you're watching this on video, to actually stop after each of these sections. Take a deep breath, write down any questions that you have that you can bring to the, uh, uh, the Q&A time. So the big picture goes into where are we and what does the evidence tell us about our near-term future and destiny? What's futile, what's inevitable? What opens up when we accept what we cannot change and avoid pushing boulders uphill? It's like that old serenity prayer, God, life, reality. Let me accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Post-doom inspiration. How can we as individuals and communities most heartfully and fruitfully respond? And how can we do so as congregations? And then what can we do? How can we be of joyous service to others, to life and to the future, no matter what? Just to let you know where I'm coming from, this is my sort of creed in a nutshell. I'm a sacred realist, a religious naturalist. I'm an evidential mystic. And here's my, uh, what I sometimes call my eco-theo credo. Reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. The epic of evolution is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And what I mean by integrity are the practices and exercises that help me live in right relationship to reality. So reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. The epic of evolution is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And fostering accountability to the future is my mission. So the big picture. I love this quote from Ed Wilson. The evolutionary epic is probably the best myth that we will ever have. And one of my most significant female mentors, Joanna Macy, said there is science now to construct the story of the journey that we've made on this earth, the story that connects us with all beings. Right now, we need to remember that story to harvest it and taste it, for we are in a hard time. And it's the knowledge of the bigger story that's going to carry us through. So I found it useful over the years to put the entire history of everyone and everything, physical evolution, biological evolution, and cultural evolution, as our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story on a 100-year timeline. At that time scale, every decade is 1.4 billion years. Each day is approximately 400,000 years. Obviously, I'm rounding these off. Each minute is 250 years. And each second is just under five years. So at that time scale, here's the familiar uh, you know, mileposts or, or landmarks along the way. This is the, the things I do longer programs where I spend, you know, 45 minutes on this entire timeline, including all of the transformations throughout biological evolution. But what I want to focus here is just the last four and a half years 
the last 550 million years just in terms of Earth's temperature. Okay, what does the evidence tell us? Now, on the left, you see degrees Celsius. On the right, you see degrees Fahrenheit. And this is a logarithmic chart, so it's easy to misread. But it works just fine for our purposes because this is the 1960 to 1990 baseline average. And so here are the 17 glacial periods, the Milankovitch cycles. The Earth, of course, wobbles like a top, which is one of the main things that catalyzes uh, these uh, glacial you know, periods. Homo habilis emerges right there, the handy human walking upright using stone tools roughly two and a half million years ago. Homo sapiens only the last three or 400,000 years. And notice the stability in the CO2 range required for agriculture and complex civilizations. It requires this stable Holocene and that the temperature range or the CO2 range is between 280 parts per million and 380 parts per million. Anybody that claims that we can have civilization, city-based, grain-based civilization, agriculture at over 380 parts per million, it's a faith claim. We have no evidence of that whatsoever. And this is evidential revelation. The fact that many religious people value old men and old books over what reality is revealing to us through evidence is, is one of the reasons why we're in the mess we are. So, what we know or what we can trust in terms of the evidence is that homo colossus, that is industrial wasteful where each of us uses 10 to 30 times the resources and exudes 10 to 30 times the waste of normal homo sapiens, this goes out roughly at this level here at about just under two degrees Celsius. RIP homo sapiens, we have no evidence that human beings in any form can survive a four degrees Celsius or higher temperature over 1750 baseline. Now here's the projections. In 20 to 30 years, this is where, this is best case and medium case. This is an even worst case scenario, IPCC. And in 60 to 80 years, we're projected to be here. And we can, how can we trust those numbers? Well, what has reality revealed? And those of you who know why I wear this green clergy shirt, because I'm committed to basically the, the greening of religion and my YouTube channel is Reverend Reality. Um, what reality is telling us is that uh, for the last, 800,000 years, here are the CO2 levels. So here we are now in July of 2020, we're up at 415 parts per million. And here we have the peak, peak glacials uh, when the glaciers were at their maximum, uh, 180 parts per million. The ice age average is 200 parts per million. Notice the eight ice ages over the last 800,000 years. Pre-industrial average turns out between 280 and 320 parts per million is ideal for growing grains at scale. Agricultural collapse and really civilizational collapse becomes really unavoidable at 380 and above parts per million. That's one of the reasons why James Hansen and, and Bill McKibben and the whole 350.org is that we have no evidence that humans can survive other than in small pockets beyond 350 parts per million. So we speak of climate change. We think a gradual linear process, but it's far more accurate to talk about abrupt climate change, runaway climate change, irreversible climate change. And we can know that because here's where we are in terms of CO2 equivalent in July of 2020, which is when I'm recording this. We're already at 500, we're actually above 500 parts per million of CO2 equivalent. That is when you factor carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide we're actually above 500 parts per million already. And we know that we see a rise and fall, the global concentration of sea level, global temperature and CO2 concentration all march and fall in lockstep. That's happened for 800,000 and a lot, I mean, uh, a lot longer than that. This is just uh, 450,000 years, this, is, this one. But we know it's gonna be going up. So it's not gonna be long before global temperature and sea level rises considerably. So when we speak of abrupt, runaway, irreversible, not just climate change, but climate destabilization, here's a chart that shows this. For 50 years, we've had 33 climate conferences and a half a dozen major international agreements, but they've not reduced atmospheric carbon concentrations one bit. This is sobering. That's what I mean by sobering inspiration for hard times. We haven't even got to the inspiration part yet. That's the last part of this program. So coming back here to our to cosmic century timeline. All of human history 
all of human history is just the last week on a cosmic century timeline. So we've got climate change, Milankovic cycles, asteroids and super volcanoes, plate tectonics, which of course create volcanoes and tsunamis. This has existed long before us and this will exist long after us, even if we survive the next million or two million years before an asteroid or super volcano or something takes us out. No mammal our size lasts more than a few million years, but we could go extinct much sooner, but it doesn't matter. All these things are gonna continue. And so when we look at how things were for the last week, the last 2.8 million years on this time frame, we see what I call ecotheo. That is where the eco, the e ecology, was related to as divine, as a greater thou, not a lesser it. And the theo, the spirit world, was infused within the living world in all tribal cultures that we know of. It's called animism. That's a Western um, anthropological term, animism. That is everything related to as a being, as a thou, not just as it to be exploited. So we see just in the last 40 minutes from, uh, like at the beginning of the universe is one second after midnight of, of the year zero, okay, on January 1st. And right now is the 99th year, December 31st of the 99th year at midnight, just about to go into the 100th year. At that time scale, only for the last week, December 25th of the 99th year until now is all of human history. And so only the last 40 minutes is what we associate with civilization and all that kind of stuff. This is where we see anthropocentric, human-centered religions and boom and bust civilizations. And if we survive this bottleneck, it will only be because we have returned, like, that's why I call it the prodigal species, we'll have, we have, we'll have returned to, a, to relating to primary reality as primary, as more important than us. So, you know, you hear people talk about language, you know, well, you don't expect this to go back to living in the Stone Age, do you? Well, notice the derogatory sense, the Stone Age. You think of cavemen. No, if you want an accurate portrayal of the Stone Age, watch Kevin Costner's film, Dances with Wolves. That's an excellent picture of Stone Age living. Mythically speaking, in the garden, you know, when we lived intimately with the rest of the body of life and related to God as a personification of reality, not a person outside reality. What's the future hold? Well, we could go extinct. We could go extinct soon. That's absolutely a possibility. However, the three visions of us surviving, at least some of us surviving, that I find most inspiring is the Ecozoic era, that's Thomas Berry and Brian Swim, Bali with electronics, William Ophels, and then John Michael Greer speaks of the ecotechnic societies. These are three profoundly grounded in ecology thinkers. Thomas Berry, one of the significant ecological and evolutionary thinkers of the 20th century. His, this Schumacher lecture, which is uh, both in written form and you can listen to the audio, uh, the Ecozoic Era, it's, the, it's a fabulous summing up of Thomas Berry's thinking. And I recorded the whole thing. It's available up on SoundCloud here. William Ophels has done more to bring the ecological paradigm to governance and politics. Uh, one of my intellectual mentors, here are some of his books. I've recorded the audio of all of these. Um, and here's a great quote. Sustainability, as usually understood, is an oxymoron. Industrial man has used the found wealth of the new world and the stocks of fossil hydrocarbons to create an anti-ecological titanic. Making the deck chairs recyclable, painting them red or blue, feeding the boilers with biofuels, and every other effort to transform or green the Titanic will ultimately fail. In the end, the ship is doomed by the laws of thermodynamics and by implacable biological and geological limits that are already beginning to bite. We shall soon be obliged to trade in the Titanic for a schooner. In other words, a post-industrial future that however technologically sophisticated resembles the pre-industrial past in many important respects. John Michael Greer, one of my favorite authors, I've read 14 of his books in the last seven years. I've recorded about nine of them. Um, in fact, I recorded the official uh, studio recorded uh, uh, edition of, of the audiobook of Dark Age America. But th this, is, this will give you a sense of, of John Michael Greer's perspective. He says, when you've driven down a blind alley and are sitting there with your bumper pressed up against a brick wall, the, the way forward, the only way to progress starts with backing up. Revving the engine and hearing it label, labor and rattle as the gas gauge moves steadily toward that unwelcome letter E 
or praying for a techno miracle are not particularly useful responses. So let's take a look at just the last hour, the last 17,000 years on this cosmic century timeline. So we're looking at 11 p.m. to midnight on December 31st of the 99th year. So prior to about 1120, we still had eco-theo relating, hunter-gatherers, early horticulture, what I call permaculture 1.0, and sustainable forms of agriculture, which are ecocentric, they're not anthropocentric. What we see, Daniel Quinn calls it totalitarian agriculture, emerging about 10,000 years ago, where we don't care about any other species, it's now all about us. Chieftains and kingdoms uh, emerge uh, about a half hour ago, uh, seven and a half thousand years ago. And here's where we start seeing the parable of the tribes. Uh, I encourage you to Google parable of the tribes and, and uh, see that's a profound uh, understanding. City states and writing emerges about 5,000 years ago. Empires just right after that. And then the axial age, this, the last 2,500 years, the solo escape from the world that is written based uh, human-centered religions, where it's all about escaping the natural world, and it's all transcendent and otherworldly oriented. This is just the last two and a half thousand years, the last 10 minutes on this, uh, this time scale. We know of over a hundred boom and bust civilizations, that is progress, regress, progress, regress, boom and bust, uh, rise and fall. Um, so I'll say a lot more about this in the second program in this series, but um, we have examples of these are unsustainable city-based civilizations between 1135 and 1159 p.m. on this time frame. We only see a trivial, otherworldly, um, uh, ecocidal clockmaker god and a clockwork universe, the sense that the universe is like a complex machine, like a clock. We've only had that worldview since we understood clocks. We only invented clocks about 600 years ago. So this is just the last 500 years we have this, this paradigm, the mechanistic paradigm. And then industrial overshoot and the sixth mass extinction, and the carbon pulse, just in the last minute. Here's what I mean by the carbon pulse. If you go back 8,000 years, and you go forward 8,000 years, the main forms of energy were muscle, human and animal muscle power, and firewood, and that's what we're gonna go back to. And we're just post-peak. We're between two and 10 years post-conventional uh, uh, oil. We're now into the harder to get, dirtier, much more expensive stuff. And so this is what we'll be back to. And we've known this since the 1950s, but the expectation from the 1950s to the early 1980s was that nuclear power would power our future. And that only began really ebbing in the late 70s and the, and the, the final nail in the coffin of that pipe dream was this book, Overshoot, by William Catton. The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change, the single most important book my wife Connie Barlow and I have ever read. Uh, many of us consider this the most important book of the 20th century. Um, Stuart Udall, the former Interior Secretary under the uh, President Kennedy and Johnson, wrote the foreword to this, and this is a devastating critique of techno-utopian thinking. Here's the sobering part. We have 440 nuclear reactors around the world that assume industrial civilization has eternal life when we're already 30 years into an irreversible, runaway, abrupt climate change. And if you're not familiar with the difference between linear climate change and abrupt climate change, there's no place better to go than this little 27-minute YouTube video by meteorologist Nick Humphrey, Ongoing Abrupt Climate Change and Consequences. It's really a summing up of his 16-part series. I've recorded the SoundCloud. I've recorded the, uh, all of those. Um, but here are some other resources. Paul Beckwith is amazing, his 15-minute videos. John Doyle, uh, 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 Robert Hunziker published something, 10 degrees Celsius over baseline just a couple months ago. Alice Friedman. And then, of course, Guy McPherson and Kevin Hester have been, and Sam Carana have been sounding the alarm on this. But uh, I'm just leaving this here so you can come back to this and explore this because it's important that we understand abrupt climate change. When most of the Arctic ice is gone is when the serious global warming begins. And you can learn about that from all those people, but especially from meteorologist Nick Humphrey and uh, Paul Beckwith as well. So coming back here to our last hour, I consider the last 35 to 40 minutes as the age of idolatry, the age of human centeredness. Idolatry isn't bowing down to statues. Idolatry isn't believing in the wrong God. Idolatry is human centeredness anthropocentrism rather than life-centeredness, ecocentrism, 
or ecotheocentrism. And I go into this much more. You can't understand this if you have a trivial, impotent, otherworldly, inconsequential, supernatural only notion of the divine. So let's just untrivialize the word God for a moment. Our God, your God, is whatever we put our faith or trust in. It's our ultimate concern. One of the most famous theologians of the 20th century, Paul Tillich, famously identified faith as your ultimate concern. So it doesn't matter what you believe in. If your faith is in the market, if your faith is in technology, that's your God. If your faith is in the biosphere and sun relationship, then that's your ultimate concern. Turns out that sustainable cultures always put their faith or trust and their commitment in what we would call the biosphere. That's what I mean by eco-theo. And I cover this in much more depth in my second program, Embracing Our Predicament, Trading Confusion for Clarity, which is where I get into how did we get here, why is it unavoidable, and then what now? So for the purposes of this program, all I'm going to say is that whether spelt G-O-D, all caps, with, a, with the earth in the middle, you know, uh, it includes, think Russian nesting dolls, right? That's the nature of reality. So the biosphere is part of the essence of reality, and we're part of it. And many feminists and, and uh, Catholic nuns and eco-feminists spell God the Old English way, G-O-D-D-E. -D -E, that's the way it was spelled in Old English. And because it's gender neutral, for one, and what we're meaning not is a person outside reality, what we're meaning is reality with a personality. It's personification of reality, an I-thou relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real. It's not about beliefs. It doesn't matter whether you believe in reality or not. But like every species, we need to live in right relationship to reality or we go extinct. Again, my YouTube channel is Reverend Reality. So as activists, these are the kinds of things that we focus on, and rightfully so. Except that all of these, without exception, are symptoms of ecological overshoot, which is itself caused by human-centeredness, idolatry, human-centered hubris, this idea of man, conqueror of nature, is the most single most self-destructive thought form in human history. So, and human idolatry can take a secular form as well as a religious form. Religious idolatry is having a trivial, finite, limited, unreal, and otherworldly notion of the divine. Because if your ultimate concern is something otherworldly, then you're not going to even be paying attention to this living planet with any sense of divine responsibility, a sense of responsibility and commitment. But there are secular forms of idolatry as well your secular God, if progress or technology or the market is your ultimate concern, then that's your God. And this is a human-centered form of idolatry. Again, I'll go into this in spades in my next program. So we took a quick look at understanding our predicament and our trajectory. I encourage you to stop here, take a breath, because I know this is like drinking out of a fire hose, write down any questions, and then hit the play button again. Let's take a look at what's inevitable and what's futile accepting reality, and avoiding frustration. Coming back to our timeline, let's take a look at the next minute. What is reality telling us? Again, reality with a personality. Whether you use mythic language, call that God, or whether you just call that the universe, or just call it the evidence. What is the evidence telling us about what we can confidently expect in the next minute, the next 250 years on the cosmic century timeline? Well, before we even go there, it's important to realize there will be a next year. There will be 140 million years from now. Humans won't exist. No mammal our size lasts more than a few million years. So we're going to go extinct, whether that's in the next 20 to 50 years or whether that's two or three million years from now, we're going to go extinct. And one of the things that gives me hope, because again, this is the time scale we're looking at, okay? Each month is 12 million years. So a half a month from now, if today is January 1st of the year 100, that is today is July of, of the year 2020, 70 million years from now is just six months. So at this time scale, one of the things that gives me hope, really genuine hope, it's inspiring, is that the worst case scenario, let's, let's say we have World War III and it goes nuclear and all of our nuclear power plants melt down and we wipe out 90% of the other species and we go extinct as well. By early to mid February, by somewhere between early February and March at the latest, that is roughly 10 to 20 million years from now, Earth will have fully recovered. And that gives me hope because we're not going to see worst case scenario. I just don't believe we're that stupid. So what can we expect in the next minute, the next 250 years on a cosmic century timeline? Well, 
it's important to first remember where we are. I love this one. Please note, the post-apocalyptic fiction section has been moved to current affairs. And this one here, you are here. Uh, just let me be silent. Just take a look at this. Yeah, sobering to say the least. So what can we expect? This is, this is inevitable or very likely in the best case and medium case intergovernmental panel on climate change scenarios. So this is the next 250 minutes. We will see climate chaos. There'll be bigger storms, bigger droughts, growing deserts, more intense wildfires, and the Arctic methane. This is the big wild card. The BOE is the blue ocean event. You can Google that one. Paul Beckwith does a whole lot. In fact, I think he coined the term. But the, the release of Arctic methane, that's the thing that could really spin out in a, in a brutally fast way. But all of this is inevitable. We can't stop it. We will see a sea level rise of between 25 to 40 feet. And that's true if every human being went extinct. If some virus wiped us out tonight, we'd still see the seas rise 25 to 40 feet over the next 250 years, the next minute on this cosmic century timeline. And there's no scientist that deals with the oceans that would debate what I'm saying. I learned this from the former head of the Jacques Cousteau Society, John Englander. We're already in the sixth mass extinction and we're quite possibly on the list and the end of the fossil fuel era, as I showed in that carbon pulse little chart. There will be a toxic legacy, chemical and nuclear wastes and a contamination of many, probably most ocean shorelines. Many communities won't be able to think about sea level rise, 25 to 40 feet. This is all the major cities of the world that are anywhere near the ocean being inundated. Many of these communities will not be able to afford, even if they can technologically do it, to move all that toxic waste away. And that's going to contaminate some of the ocean shorelines. Population will shrink to under a half a billion, under 500 million, simply due to drought, famine, war, and living in a post-antibiotic age and living in an age like we're seeing with coronavirus of uh, novel viruses and viruses being released from the permafrost that haven't been around for a long time, including possibly smallpox. This is inevitable. Again, this is under half a billion in the next minute on the cosmic century time. It could be a lot quicker than that. And again, the reason we know that is the Earth's carrying capacity for human beings, and I'm not even talking about Homo colossus, I'm talking about Homo sapiens, was never more than half a billion until the discovery of fossil fuels, until we started mining half a billion years of stored sunlight. This is not sustainable. That's why Earth's carrying capacity will go back to under a half a billion. Infrastructures deteriorating. We're already seeing this in the mass migration of people, plants, and animals. What we're seeing in different parts of the world, Syria, Venezuela, other parts of the world now is just the beginning. Mexico is expected to be like the Sahara Desert, much of it in the next 250 years. Where are those people going to go? They're going to go north, they're going to go south, and no wall is going to stop them. The end of the American empire, that could be the next few seconds. Because remember, each second of the cosmic century, century timeline is only five years. So that could be in the next you know, four or five seconds. Um, and the extinction of industrial Homo colossus. This is inevitable. It doesn't necessarily mean the extinction of Homo sapiens, but it could. The death of techno idolatry, the secular faith in religious progress, technology, green growth. These are a pipe dream. And I'll say a lot more about this. I have a 24 minute pinker takedown video called Sane versus Insane Progress. It's up on YouTube. I'll be going into this material in, in my second program in this series. But here are the key points. How we define and measure progress determines our behavior and what kind of a world we're leaving to our grandchildren and other species. Hoping for perpetual progress via techno-fix solutions fosters complacency instead of responsible pro-future actions. Problems caused by economic growth and development will not be solved by more of the same. Indeed, our predicament will worsen. And understanding ecology, energy, and history undermines expectations that human ingenuity, technology, or the market can save industrial civilization. And again, I'll go into that more in the second program. Salvage, here we start seeing some good news. The salvage and ecotechnic societies, permaculture, relocalization, degrowth, regeneration. These will be spread globally. Um, uh, these will spread like wildfire. Uh, and salvage is, it's important to remember, salvage economies, long after we, we no longer have the energy to mine metals, 
we've got tons of metals in all our cities that can be repurposed. Millions may be able to live joyful and meaningful lives. Now, how can I say may? Well, remember, the best case and medium case IPCC scenario states that, you know, in fact, that's not, they don't even include worst case, the Arctic methane. We're now, we're actually, it turns out that we're not on best case or medium case scenario. In fact, in some cases, on some measurements, we're exceeding worst case scenarios. And the Arctic methane, the blue ocean event, that's profound. So we may go extinct. We absolutely may. And the majority of people will deny most of the above right up into the end. And I don't mean the end of time. I mean the end of their lives. We see this. We have, again, over 100 examples of previous collapsing empires and civilizations, and most people never get it. Most people never wake up and have this enlightened consciousness. Most people go to their grave in denial. And again, denial is not just a river in Egypt, right? Denial is the largely unconscious habit of thought, whereby we refuse to accept the reality of things that are bad or upsetting, or that challenge our worldview, our legacy, how we live, what is required of us, and or our feelings of self-worth or superiority. Denial is also the instinctual impulse to reject or discount information that calls into question our hopes, assumptions, or expectations about the future. All of us, including me, are prone to denial. If you find yourself wanting to reject some or lots of what I've already been saying, just honor that. Don't make it wrong. This is natural. This is inevitable. We all experience denial. I've heard of denial. I just don't believe in it. Burying my head in the sand over climate change is much easier now that half the world has turned to desert. It's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. And who of us can't relate to this one? My desire to be well-informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. <laughs> Stephen Jenkinson, amazing death worker, uh, the grief walker. Um, I love this one. Inattention. That's not paying attention to the world's ecological state is well advised because attention to it mitigates against your happiness, contentment, and your sense of well-being. Having a conscience now is a grief-soaked proposition. Whatever spiritual awakening has meant in the past, if you awaken in our time, he says, you will awaken with a sob. And I highly recommend Stephen Jenkinson's the hour and 10 minute long documentary called Grief Walker, which is fabulous, award-winning Canadian. And then his book, Die Wise. So we've looked at what is inevitable or highly likely in the next 250 years. What's futile? We don't want to invest our time and energy in what's futile. Well, hoping and praying for everlasting progress, or if we all just, turns out those are the two least likely things that happen as we've seen through previous contracting and collapsing civilizations and empires. And yet most people believe those two things. So it's also futile to expect your loved ones to not hope or believe in one of these delusions. So we can have compassion for ourselves and each other. Assuming that technology or the market can sustain what is unsustainable, it's futile. Faith in the techno ecocidal religion of everlasting growth on a finite planet. Expecting our mismatched instincts to not at least occasionally challenge us or our loved ones. But for years, for almost a decade, Connie and I did programs on evolutionary psychology and brain science. I'm not going to get in, into any of this now, but um, we need to honor that our mismatched instincts are going to occasionally be problematic. And as Plato noted, as civilizations contract, addictions of all kinds ramp up. Denying that impermanence, death and extinction are real and necessary. Expecting the elite and powerful to repent of human centeredness or anthropocentrism prior to collapse is not going to happen. Expecting industrial civilization and global capitalism to run on renewable energy. This is a difficult, this is a bitter pill for many progressives and liberals to swallow because that's what we've been putting our faith in. That's what we've been putting our hope in. Um, and notice the controversy that's come around since Michael Moore and Jeff Gibbs film uh, documentary, Planet of the Humans. We've seen scathing attacks from the liberals, especially in progressives. Understandably so, understandably so. And I highly recommend these four uh, reviews. The reviews not only of the, the movie, but also reviews of the reviewers. And I, I just highly recommend these. Uh, 
uh, Megan uh, Seibert, uh, Planet of the Humans Review, shining a light on the energy black box. Uh, William Reese is the co-founder of the um, ecological footprint concept. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Robson in Dark Green Resistance and then the Green Flame. These are four things. I'm just going to invite you to come back to this. If you're not convinced that uh, green energy uh, is, is a pipe dream in terms of saving industrial civilization, um, you get me to check these out, as does this one. Who Stands with the Bears? I just read this this morning. A Defense of Planet of the Humans by Tom Smith at the Dark Mountain Project. Also, uh, in early next year, March of 2021, this book is coming out, Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, Max Wilbert, uh, Bright Green Lies, and then Bright Green Lies, the uh, documentary. So this is stuff coming out early next year, but all of this counters the I idolatry of technology that many of us progressives and liberals uh, still are holding on to. And then finally, expecting your technophile and planmeister friends that is those that expect if we just have the right plan, we can all do it, to not call you a doomer for giving up. They'll claim that you're giving up. They'll call you a doomer. Expect that. Just have compassion for them. Don't, don't let it rile you. So again, I encourage you to stop here, turn it off, write down any questions, take a few breaths, and then come back to this. Post-doom inspiration. What am I meaning by post-doom inspiration? Well, I have a a podcast series called Post Doom Conversations. And this is my introduction. This is, Connie considers this probably the best sermon I've ever preached called Post Doom Inspiration, Honoring Grief, Empowering Action. It's up on YouTube. Um, and these conversations, I've had like 50 conversations with amazing leaders all over the world, regenerative conversations, exploring overshoot grief, grounding in gratitude. So let me define the terms. And you can all find all of this at postdoom.com is my major project in 2020. So by doom, what I'm meaning is the common feeling of ugh or dread upon realizing that technological progress and economic growth and development are actually the root of our predicament, not our way out. When you get that, it feels like ugh. A name for the anxiety and fear called forth when living in a coronavirus era that triggers an economic depression. And then the midpoint between denial and regeneration, with or without us. See, most people avoid feeling doom because they think they're going to stay there the rest of their lives and have despair the rest of their lives. No, doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration, with or without us. Earth will regenerate. Life will regenerate. I call it compost theology. <laughs> Resurrection isn't just about one God-man 2,000 years ago. It's about the nature of nature. It's what happens. And so doom is the midpoint. And when we allow ourselves to go through that, to feel the stages of grief and then go through that, we open up to a huge realm of new possibilities. That's what I'm exploring in this conversation series. So post-doom is what opens up when we accept the inevitable, honor our grief, and prioritize what's redemptive, pro-future, and soul-nourishing. And by redemptive, I don't mean anything otherworldly or supernatural. Post-doom is a fierce and fearless reverence for life and relative equanimity, even in the midst of abrupt climate change, a global pandemic, and collapse of both the health of the biosphere and business as usual. And post-doom is living meaningfully, compassionately, and courageously, no matter what. So post-doom inspiration, remember who you are and what matters most. This is my, the two things that I think make the biggest difference in helping us really live in that place of possibility on the other side of the doom door. Percy Shelley in 1812. I love this. First is that sense of an expanded sense of identity, that who you are doesn't stop with your skin. Percy Shelley said, I am the eye with which the universe beholds itself and knows it is divine. Carl Sagan said it well. He says, we are the local embodiment of a cosmos grown to self-awareness. We have begun to contemplate our origins, star stuff pondering the stars. Brian Swim has a couple of great quotes. He says, four billion years ago, Earth was molten rock, and now it sings opera. You know, Earth was once molten rock, and now it sings opera. And nobody put anything here. When the Bible, like Genesis 2-7 and other mythic texts speak of us, you know, God forming us from the dust of the ground. This is us emerging out of the body of life and its reality as a whole. We are the earth, molten rock. Now it's singing opera. Oh, actually, I've got one other quote uh, from Brian Swim. He says, here you can take the whole history of the universe and sum it up in two sentences. 
You take a great cloud of hydrogen gas and you just leave it alone and it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. Now, if that's not a sacred story, I don't know what is. Earth is our larger body. It's our larger self. This isn't just a human being look at the earth. This is when the earth became complex enough that a piece of itself could get off of itself and look back at itself. We are part of the body of life, not separate from it and not superior to it. The other important aspect, in addition to this expanded sense of identity, again, think Russian nesting dolls, um, also recognizing the sacred necessity of impermanence and death. And again, this comes out of both a religious or philosophical or spiritual perspective, but mostly from science. This is what a meaningful, inspiring view of the science tells us. For many years, Connie and I did programs on a sacred science approach to mortality and death. We take a look, this is one of the charts we used back in the day. Uh, we took a look at the major sciences, paleontology, evolutionary biology, embryology, cell biology, and ecology, astronomy and astrophysics, and geology, and then geography and math. And what are the major scientific discoveries in each of those that have helped us come to see that death is not only a, not a problem, that death is necessary, that we can't have a universe without death. And we created a litany that's been often used in moderate to liberal Christian and Unitarian Universalist and other church settings and, and Jewish synagogues as well, the gifts of death. Because when we cherish mortality and realize that death could be imminent, what matters most becomes blazingly obvious. It's why religious traditions have always spoken about having the awareness of your mortality as an advisor, as something that's profound that opens up for us when we don't deny the fact that we could die in the next year. And if you don't know that, living in a coronavirus era, that you and your loved ones, somebody could die in the next year, you're living out of touch with reality. But rather than denying that, embrace that fact. Mountains die, oceans die, continents die. Without the death of species, there would be no complex life. Without the death of fetal cells in the embryonic stage of development, we'd all be spheres. The reason we have shape is because cells died here, 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 and here. Without the death of plants and animals, there would be no food. And this is obvious when we think about it. We're just not used to thinking in these terms. Without the death of stars, there would be no periodic table of elements, no planets, no life. Without the death of elders, there would be no room for children. I mean, think about it. In a finite world, if all you have is birth with no death, pretty quickly, you're wall-to-wall -wall people, wall-to-wall -wall bacteria, wall-to-wall -wall skunks, 60 feet deep. It doesn't take, take long. Without death, there would be no ancestors. Without death, time would not be precious. What then are the gifts of death? The gifts of death are Mars and Mercury, Saturn and Earth. The gifts of death are the atoms of stardust within our bodies. The gifts of death are the splendors of shape and form and color. The gifts of death are diversity, the immense journey of life. The gifts of death are food, the sustenance of life. The gifts of death are seeing, hearing, feeling, deeply feeling. The gifts of death are the urgency to act, the desire to fully be and become. The gifts of death are joy and sorrow, laughter and tears. The gifts of death are lives that are fully and exuberantly lived then graciously and gratefully given up for now and forevermore. Amen. And again, when this is used as litany, sometimes the women will say one line and the men will say another or people on the right-hand side or whatever. It's been used a lot. Death is natural and necessary. Here's the bottom line. Death is natural and necessary at every level of reality, and thus death is no less sacred than life. Legacy, consciousness, there's a difference between an honorable death and a dishonorable death. And we can now think about that very profoundly. Back nine years ago, I think it was, David Brooks of the New York Times wrote a piece on death and budgets. And he said, we think the budget mess is a squabble between partisans in Washington. But in large measure, it's about our inability to face death and our willingness as a nation to spend whatever it takes to push it just slightly over the horizon. This is the way that many of us, the system, the, the, the incentives in the system would lead many of us to die like this. And imagine this person, you know, 80, let's say he's 82 years old. He had a wonderful legacy, uh, had a profound impact on many, many, many people. And then in the last eight months of his life or six months in his life, he's kept alive like this at the cost of, say, 62 college, college educations. What's his net legacy? 
Our technology has allowed us to have physical suffering, emotional distress, family discord, and societal costs that our ancestors never had to deal with. Our ancestors never had to say no to technology like this, and yet many of us, if we don't say no to this, this is the way we're going to end up. So until we grasp that death plays a vital and necessary role in an evolving cosmos, Christianity will continue to be shackled by otherworldly notions of the gospel, as if the great news is merely cosmic fire insurance. Medical technologies will continue to prolong physical and emotional suffering and provoke family discord. The medical industry will continue to underwrite the widening gap between the rich and the poor. And seniors and their families will continue to be seduced into perhaps the greatest generational injustice and legacy diminishing evil in history. And I encourage you to Google COVID legacy pledge for boomers and beyond that my wife wrote, as well as something she wrote a decade ago, Connie's end of life legacy expanding insurance idea, thegreatstory.org slash legacy.pdf. I've mentioned Stephen Jenkinson before. I do it because I love his stuff. He brings a science-based, but also indigenous, earth-honoring, sacred ecological understanding to mortality and death. And I highly recommend these, as well as my post-Doom conversation, or Barbara Cecil and I actually co-hosted a conversation with Stephen Jenkinson. And I love this quote, not success, not growth, not happiness. The cradle of your love of life is death. So again, I encourage you to Stop the, stop the recording, take notes, take questions, you know, breathe, and then come back to this. Final session, what can we do? Engaging in prophetic and redemptive great work. These are what I call the five L's of sane living. Love something, learn something, let go of something, laugh at something, and pass something forward, legacy. Love something green, love something other than human, something more than human. Learn something and learn something for the sake of pure enjoyment that you just love learning about it. For example, the last seven years, I've been learning about the rise and fall of civilizations. In fact, these two, these two uh, presentations that are part of this uh, um, little series is really the result. It's a summing up of seven years of uh, graduate and undergraduate and graduate level education. Let go of something. We can all can let go of things. Uh, and John Michael Greer calls it collapse now and avoid the rush. Laugh at something. Gallows humor is important at this time, especially just to keep a sense of humor. You go crazy if you don't. And then pass something forward. You have gifts, you have skills, you have knowledge that you can pass on to someone else. This, this legacy consciousness, vital, these five L's for sane living. Engaging in redemptive great work. Thomas Berry's book, one of his books is The Great Work, Our Way into the Future. Learn and feel together. Learn about deep adaptation together and feel the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Feel these with others. Find strength and support in community. If you're not familiar with deep adaptation, check it out. This paper by Jim Bendel, most academic papers are read by a few dozen people. Uh, more than three quarters of a million people have read this paper. Deep Adaptation, a map for navigating climate tragedy, written just two years ago. Um, I've also had a post-doom conversation. In fact, this was the very first post-doom conversation I had in a coronavirus era. Um, the Deep Adaptation Forum, Professional Network, there's a positive Deep Adaptation Facebook group. And then I've recorded about a dozen of Jem Bendel's writings, over, including his Deep Adaptation paper. So you can find all of that up on SoundCloud. Honor your sadness and grief. Your grief, not just climate grief, but grief of expectations, grief of a sense of legacy. Many of us in our, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s are needing to reinterpret our legacy. And there can be a grief there. Grief requires us to know the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful and, or hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. And I love this one from Joanna Macy. The depth of your grief is the measure of your love. And it's not a matter of wallowing in grief. It's possible to recover from grief and to always allow it to nurture your soul. 
So we're familiar, most of us, with the stages of grief. Of course, we don't ever go through this in a linear way. We cycle back again and again and again. That's normal. That's natural. That's healthy. I could do a whole program just on this. But Paul Traferco, one of my older brothers on the path, somebody I hold in highest esteem, speaks of finding the gift on the other side of mere acceptance, finding the gift and local post-doom. I don't even like the word activism. I like love in action. Whatever love motivates you to do in being in action. And here again is the importance of gallows humor. The Good Grief Network, I highly recommend the Good Grief Network, 10 Steps to Personal resili Resilience and Empowerment in a Chaotic Climate. Uh, I interviewed uh, Laura and Amy, who are the founders uh, of the Good Grief Network, and it's a fabulous conversation. They do a wonderful overview. I highly recommend this and their program. Prophetic love in action. Relinquish human centeredness in any and every way you can and honor the living world as thou. When you go outside, if you remind yourself that this is Gaia, this is God, this is, this is the living, pulsing presence of reality, whether you use mythic language or not, this is divine. It's a greater thou, not a lesser if. That is relinquish human centeredness and honor the living world as thou. Grow in integrity. And again, by integrity, I mean right relationship to reality. And then fall in love with a place or species and protect, foster, and defend it. One of the things that we often don't think about, I, this, this quote from one of my intellectual heroes and mentors, Teddy Goldsmith, who wrote a major, amazing book called The Way, an Ecological Worldview. I'll say a lot about that in the second program. But this is a sobering quote. He says, isn't it astonishing that we can completely destroy this planet, make it uninhabitable, and ensure the extinction of our species and countless others without violating a, a single law? See, that's the thing. The playing field has been tipped so we can destroy the planet without violating a single law. It's one of the reasons why prophetic love and redemptive love in action often entails us countering that because it's not just immoral. It is evil to irreparably harm the future for short-term personal or institutional gain. Yet we have a global economic system supported by governments on every continent and accepted by adherents of every faith, ensuring that it's not only legal to betray posterity, it's profitable, highly profitable. So, how do we live? What do we do? And how should we confront what is anti-future and thus evil? In other words, how do we protest and non-violently, lovingly resist modern day structural, organizational, and institutional, that is legal evil? Well, of course, that's what Mahatma Gandhi was all about. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. was all about, was, was confronting in love, in non-violently, legal evil, systemic injustice. And there are ways that we can be pro-future in our loving in action, love in action, in, 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 in uh, less public ways. My wife is one of the world's experts in, in this field of assisting trees and migrating north. Uh, I love this quote from Paul Hawken. He says, there's a rabbinical teaching that says, if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. And this field of assisted migration, this is my wife, Connie Barlow. Uh, she's one of the main point people in this field of assisting trees and migrating, native trees. It's legal to do this. Trees have been migrating north and south for millions and millions of years with the glaciers. And now they need our assistance. The difference between hundreds of species of native trees going extinct this century and those same hundred species, more than hundred, hundreds of species of trees and shrubs surviving this century will entirely depend on humans assisting them in migrating. And a major new book coming out this month, July of 2020, by Zach St. George, The Journeys of Trees, a story about forests, people, and the future. Norton Publication, top publisher. And uh, Connie's the main character in this book, or one of the main characters. Building topsoil and planting trees while nurturing community is perhaps the most holy work we can be engaged in. Permaculture, agroecology, I love this, indigenuity, ingenuity and indigenous wisdom, regeneration. Anything that you can do to participate in these movements is a healthy, holy, uh, life-giving, pro-future thing to do. Regenerative agriculture shifts the paradigm. This is a profound body of research, the whole world of regeneration. And I've, I've already interviewed several of the leading voices, David Holmgren, co-founder co of the 
of permaculture. Denise Rushing, this is a fabulous conversation with a permaculturist and also somebody who gets the big picture in terms of the universe story. Joe Brewer, dear brother, who I love. I've done programs with him. You can find on YouTube. And then Daniel Christian Wall. These are just four of the amazing voices that in this post-doom conversation series that are all about regeneration. I highly recommend their writings, their work, their videos. So, less. John Michael Greer, you know, the author of Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush and, and other 14 books that I've read in the last, uh, the last seven years, he talks about we can all adapt to and should adapt to as a moral imperative, less, less energy, less stuff, less stimulation. It's downshifting. And then to complete your life and legacy, that is attending to what matters most, especially, but not only because we're living in a coronavirus era, um, but it, it's important to live your life or it's, it's soul nourishing and meaningful to live your life as if you could die in the next year anyway. And so attending, expressing gratitude, make a list. I made a list. I had 125 people on my list of people who I wanted to express gratitude to that had been a blessing or a contribution to my life. And I've just been reaching out to them, you know, just a few times a week. I reach out letter or phone call or email or whatever. So expressing gratitude, expressing regrets. Who are the people who you, you've had a negative impact on that you've harmed, betrayed, hurt, or in some way disappointed? And then just reach out to them humbly. It can just be a sentence or two. It can just be, hey, I've just been thinking about my life and I realized I never apologized to you for that time I did X, Y, or Z or said X, Y, or Z. And I don't even expect you to forgive me. I just want you to know that I know if I could go back and do it again, I'd do it differently. Bam! those kinds of communications, you'll make somebody's month by having a communication like that, as well as by expressing gratitude out of the blue to people who've been a blessing to you. And then just expressing care. All the people that are important in your life, or even the people that you just respect or admire, just reach out a little email or phone call or anything and just say, hey, in this coronavirus era where who knows what's happening and economic depression, I just wanted you to know that I'm reaching out to you. Just, I just care. Just been thinking about you. Hope you're doing well. These are completion conversations soul nourishing. Here's my slide of what I consider the most important things. If you want to live life fully and love the life you live, even at Teotihuacan, that is the end of the world as we know it, okay? The end of the world as we know it doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world full stop. In fact, it doesn't mean that, as the Dark Mountain Manifesto says. But this is at the end of the world as we know it, living fully and loving the life you live. Here are my uh, top recommendations expect breakdowns and unpleasant surprises. See, if you expect that, then they're not going to surprise you and irritate you and piss you off. You're going to like, oh, right, right on schedule. So expect breakdowns and unpleasant surprises. Express, ex, ex, expect unworkability. Things that did work last month, last year, last decade, and aren't working now, people that you used to be able to count on or whatever, expect that. That's what happens in contracting, collapsing empires and civilizations. Manage your meds. <laughs> meaning that we've all developed ways of coping since we were teenagers and manage them. Or if you can't, let God, let reality, let life do that. Again, I'm speaking God mythically, uh, the biosphere personified and reality beyond that. But uh, this is, you know, the whole 12 step thing. You know, I'm a recovering alcoholic. So I don't, I don't do well trying to manage my own drugs and alcohol. So I let reality, I let life do that. I let the biosphere do that as a thou. Stay curious and practice making life right. That's a secular way of saying faith in God. Make life right. Practice. Develop the muscle, the exercise, the, 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 the strength of interpreting and noticing when something happens and whatever your feelings are, just ask yourself, okay, how might this be the universe conspiring on my behalf or on our behalf? Practice making life right. See what happens for your life when you do that. Redeem what you can and accept the rest. And by redeem, I mean, you're going to always be in situations where you used to act in a certain way that wasn't fully in integrity, that, that you didn't feel proud of, that you didn't feel excited about, or that was hurtful to somebody else. And then you're in similar situations in the future, just act differently. In that way, you're redeeming uh, your own life story. You're redeeming the, the relationships that you have. And then accept the rest. Just accept that things are, we, we're all doing the best we can given what we had to work with. And those people that irritate you, if you had their genes, their history, and their beliefs, you'd probably be just like them. So again, lighten up. Be gentle and forgiving with yourself and others. These are just practical ways of living, but these help us live life fully and love the life we live, even in contracting, collapsing times. Live and love 
as if this were your last year. And I mean that seriously. This is a book, Stephen uh, Levine, A Year to Live, How to Live This Year as If It Were Your Last. You may not you know, aligned with his Buddhist metaphysics. It doesn't matter. This is a great book, practical exercises. There's lots of great stuff there. So live in love as if this were your last year. Connie and I do that. We treat each season as if it could be our last, just because it's a wonderful way to live. Cultivate a habit of compassionate generosity. This is a very famous quote from Albert Einstein. A human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a sort of optical delusion of our consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. I suggest that these populations, these groups are especially deserving of compassion and generosity. Poor people, communities and nations who will suffer the most from climate and ecological breakdowns yet contributed least to the causes. Those of us feeling the loneliness of having to navigate our own downshifting expectations while it's family, friends, and maybe even spouses are in denial loved ones dying in COVID-19 isolation, and all beings, human and more than human, who will suffer from the social, political, economic, and ecological collapse of industrial civilization. Techno-optimists and free market fundamentalists who will remain in denial the longest, yet be hardest hit emotionally and financially when reality bites. We know this happens because in previous collapsing civilization, that's what happens. People stay in denial the longest, the wealthy and the elite, those that the system is still benefiting, stay in denial the longest, and they're the ones hardest hit emotionally and financially when reality bites. I suggest we have compassion, that all of us have compassion for these folks rather than yin, yang yang judgment. Religious, political, and social liberals and quote unquote progressives whose faith in the religion of perpetual progress is currently being shaken, shattered, or abandoned. I expect that's most of us watching this. And then finally, religious conservatives and evangelicals whose faith in the Bible has blinded them to what reality has revealed evidentially about our inner, outer, social, and mortal nature and who thus struggle disproportionately with addiction, teen pregnancy, domestic violence, depression, suicide, and sin in general. All of these folks and more are deserving of our compassion and generosity. And then finally, take 100% responsibility for your life. One of the most important things I've ever read in my life is the very first chapter of Jack Canfield's book, The Success Principles. And you can, if you just Google Jack Canfield, The Success Principles Library, you'll get there. And I've got another link just underneath it. Those are two different versions of that same chapter. Take 100% responsibility for your life. My son, my, young, my, my only son, this was life-changing. He was profoundly addicted to internet gaming and, and this sort of thing. And um, it was reading that chapter that changed his life. And I know others as well. I highly recommend it. In fact, if you take time to read that chapter, you'll forget everything else in this program. And you'll say that that was life-changing. I promise. You don't need to do everything. Do what calls your heart. Effective action comes from love. It is unstoppable. And it is enough. The sorrow, grief, and rage you feel is a measure of your humanity and your evolutionary maturity. As your heart breaks open, there will be room for the world to heal. Sooner or later, we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. I love this quote from Robert Louis Stevenson. That's what we're in. We're in the early stages of what I call the Great Reckoning. And this is now unavoidable. However, it can also, I believe, be the great homecoming. Humanity, the prodigal species, after squandering our inheritance, waking up to our predicament in the pig pen, as it were, and coming home to life, to reality as divine. Do not lose heart. We were made for these times. Action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. 
So again, just to recap where I've covered in this program, finding meaning in the dark, sobering inspiration for hard times, the big picture, understanding our predicament and our trajectory, what's inevitable and what's futile, accepting reality and avoiding frustration, post-doom inspiration, remember who you are and what matters most, and then what can we do, engaging in prophetic and redemptive great work. This is me at the bottom of Deer Creek Falls in the Grand Canyon. You see me that way down at the bottom there? And sometimes that's what it feels like right now is life is coming at us like this and it's intense. And yet I believe being present to reality on reality's terms is, is uh, the most soul nourishing and uh, truly life giving way to live. So here's where I would stop. If I was doing this program live, I'd probably take out a few slides to have it just be slightly shorter when I do this live. Uh, and then we have like a half hour Q&A. But again, more, more and more often now, uh, congregations and secular groups are giving this link out to people uh, about a week ahead of time. And then we schedule a time and then I, we, that way we could spend a good hour in Q&A about this. So at the end, if, if I do this live or at the end of the uh, Q&A session, I just let folks know that this is part of a two-part series, Finding Meaning in the Dark is where we covered where we are, what lies ahead, and how then shall we live. The second program in the series, also just over an hour, or just about an hour, is Embracing Our Predicament, Trading Confusion for Clarity. How did we get here? Why was it unavoidable? And what now? And just as an attempt to entice you to watch that one, here's the main things I cover in that second program. First things first, our name for primary reality is a life or death issue. It's an existential issue. Sustainable equals faithful. That is, I discussed the evolutionary and ecological purpose of religion and of science. Progressing toward ecocide, humanity's verdict regarding human centeredness. And then problems versus predicaments, the five stages of awareness that I got from Paul Traferka, and then post doom living. Just a little bit more, what I get to, to here is why impersonal names for the ecosphere induce human arrogance and disregard, why religion needs science, and why evidence and the ecosphere need a prophetic moral voice, why anthropocentric human-centered measures of success and well-being compel habitat destruction and collapse, and why an ecological and historical post-doom perspective is vital in these collapsing times. This is the, uh, the thumbnail. This is what it will look like on YouTube if you Google this. To explore this kind of a post-doom and a pro-future way of thinking more deeply, and what I'm about to cover is just a few of the resources. If you're not interested in going more deeply into this stuff, you can stop now. But if you wanna explore this kind of a way of thinking more deeply, and especially if you wanna share this perspective with others uh, very inexpensively and very easily, what I recommend most are our flash drives. We have two, we have a video flash drive that has 60 videos, 40 hours of our best programs, Connie Barlow's and my best programs over the last uh, 15 years. And then there's also an audio flash drive where I have the uh, 22 audio books that I've recorded with the publishers and, and the author's uh, uh, permission and uh, 200, 200 plus essays and articles, over 275 hours of audio listening. So uh, if, you, if you gotta be in lockdown from coronavirus or just like if you use an iPad or an, I mean an iPod uh, or any MP3 uh, device, I strongly encourage the audio flash drive. Um, the video one, this is what we cover. Um, just to give you a sense of, of the programs that Connie and I have delivered over the last 15 years. Uh, this is the outline uh, that uh, is sent with the, uh, with the uh, video flash drives. Here's the things that I go into. I'm not going to cover these right now, but I just want to give you an overview. You can, you can stop this and, and look at it uh, on your own time. But this is the kind of stuff that's on that video uh, as well as here. So this is all of our best programs. On, Connie's and my programs always are at the intersection of science, inspiration, and deep sustainability. So the educational audios, this is a different flash drive. Uh, this is uh, 22 audiobooks and 200 essays and articles of what I consider deep sustainability scripture. Like these are, the, these are the most inspiring writings, not just that I think, but I've been interviewing over the last seven years, various ecologists, environmentalists, uh, uh, professional scientists and saying, what are the most inspiring books that have made a biggest difference in your life? And then, are, then I reach out to the publishers and the authors if they're not already available in audio and I record them. 
And so they're all, uh, they're all on this flash drive. Here are just some of the ones, Geo Destinies by Walter Youngquist, Overshoot by Catton, uh, John Perlin, Forest Journey. You can't understand civilization if you don't understand this stuff. Um, Tom Wessels, uh, The Myth of Progress, Teddy Goldsmith, The Way, An Ecological Worldview, as well as Goldsmith's The Stable Society. I'll say much more about these in my other program as well as uh, Clive Ponting's masterful New Green History of the World and Green History of Religion by Anand Viraraj. And then Technofix, Why Technology Won't Save Us or the Environment by Michael and Joyce Hausman and an Afterburn by Richard Heinberg. Also, one of my favorite authors, uh, William Ophels. I've recorded actually four of his books, again, with his permission. Uh, three of them are very, very short, uh, but they're priceless reads. And John Michael Greer, uh, I just can't speak too highly about John Michael Greer's uh, work, uh, especially on industrial civilization and contraction and collapse and the rise and fall of civilizations. And so all of that is on the, the uh, audio flash drive. Um, and uh, there's just a slight price difference between the two of them. But I encourage you, if you get one of these flash drives or both of them, loan it out to all your friends and family and neighbors and let them drag and drop all the contents to their computer. We just want to get this stuff out. It's a great way to share this perspective, this post-doom sacred side of science perspective, um, very inexpensively. And again, you can find this all at postdoom.com slash flash drives. Now, if you're a congregation, if you're a Jewish synagogue or Christian church or Unitarian Universalist church or Unity or Religious Science Church, any kind of religious or secular organization, but especially religious, and you want the most professional done presentation of this kind of material, my Pro Future Faith course, it's eight sessions. It's published by Living the Questions. You can find more at profuturefaith.com. Uh, or livingthequestions.com. And uh, there's two parts. Part one is coming home to reality. Part two is practical wisdom. There's four sessions. They're each 20 minutes long with a study guide and everything else. I had three TV cameras on me speaking to an audience of 300 people uh, in Houston, Texas at uh, St. Paul's United Methodist Church there. And here's a little, uh, here's a little trailer. Uh, give you a little taste of what this is about. <music> We see that it's not religion or science, it's religion and science. Both are absolutely essential for the human endeavor. So this notion of ecology as the heart of theology, I call it ecotheism. It's not about believing in anything. Half of religion is gagged and tied in the trunk and the other half of religion are in the back seat cheering on the psychopathic politicians that are driving us over the cliff. <laughs> You've got thousands, maybe millions of people that are debating whether or not God exists or whether or not God is real, when the one real God, namely reality, personified or not, we've been living out of right relationship to and we are now about to experience consequences of biblical proportion. I suggest this is the fundamental distinction of our time. Not liberal or conservative, left or right, communist, capitalist, none of that. The most important distinction is pro-future or anti-future. It's accountability to the future. So here's the, uh, the outline of what those are. The first part one, coming home to reality, untrivializing God, reality is thou. The uh, evolutionary purpose uh, of religion and the religious necessity of science. The epic of evolution, cosmic timeline, I covered some of this in this program. And then thus saith reality, what's inevitable and what's needed. Again, I covered some of this in this program. Thus saith reality, what's futile and what's urgent. Why we struggle, untrivializing mythic wisdom. This is all about evolutionary psychology and brain science. Impermanence and death is sacred, embracing limits. And then staying sane, sober, and inspired in contracting times. So again, this is the most professional um, presentation of, of the material that I'm, I'm delivering. Here's my contact information, Michael B. Dowd at gmail.com, my phone. Uh, these are my main websites. Um, and then I have you, two YouTube channels, The Great Story and Reverend Reality, and all the post-Doom conversations you can find there at postdoom.com. And then I've also got two SoundCloud playlists, Grace Limits uh, and Michael Dowd. And many of those uh, audios that you find on the little flash drive, you can also, if you want to take the time, you can download them uh, from Grace Limits as well, or from SoundCloud.
And then if you want to support our work, our Patreon page is Michael Dowd and Connie Barlow.